Okay, so 3.5 is going to be how to solve the DEs. Still, we're going to have constant coefficients here. Okay, so we'll still have our constant coefficients. Um, so you'll still be able to set up an auxiliary equation. Now, remember in 3.1, we talked about the general solutions for non-homogeneous. And we said that they can be written as sorry, y equals yc plus yp. Now, yc is basically the solution to the homogeneous equation, and then yp is the particular part that has to do with the non-homogeneous solution, okay? So in order for us to figure out those two parts, there's two steps that you have to do. One is you have to solve the homogeneous equation. And we just went over a method on how to do that, right? That was using the auxiliary equations. So we have to use our auxiliary equations and we have to use those three different cases in order to figure out what yc is, okay? So you'll have a c1 times something plus a c2 times something else. Now whether that something and something else is e to the whatever or x e to the whatever or e to the whatever cosine something or e to the whatever sine something, right? It just depends. So they keep it very general with y1 and y2 because we don't know what they're gonna look like, okay? But in order for you to find the particular solution, and that's the part of the solution that particularly goes with this specific non-homogeneous equation. So depending on what you have on the right-hand side of that equal sign, that's going to give you, for each function you have on that side, is going to give you a different particular solution. So if I have this equation here, and this is zero, this will be my only solution, and I'm done, right? Just like we did in 3.3. If this is equal to a constant, then I will have a particular solution for that constant. If this is equal to x squared, I will have a particular solution for that x squared. If this is equal to sine of x, I will have a particular solution for sine of x, okay? However, every single one of those DEs is always going to have the same, I forgot what they call it, complementary solution or something like that, but the general solution, okay? For the homogeneous, that's what YC is. It's the part of the solution for the homogeneous part, okay? And then YP is the part of the solution for the non-homogeneous. Since we were doing 3.3, they were all homogeneous, weren't they? So we never had to worry about this part right here because we always had zero, okay? But now we have to worry about that part. And the way we find it is complicated, <laughs> but it is possible to find it, okay? We talked about in 3.1 how to find the Ronskins, right? Um, it basically was just a bunch of determinants, okay? So now what we're going to be doing is doing those determinants, but in specific systems, okay? So notice that once you figure out what your y1 and your y2 are, right, whether they have e's and x's or cosines or sines, whatever they are, you have that as one Ron scheme, one determinant that you'll have to figure out to get w, okay? Then you'll have another one, and it has to be in this form, zero, and then the f of x, whatever was over here on this side of the equation. Okay, and then of course the right hand side stays exactly the same as it did in the original W. Okay, this is actually Kramer's rule if you remember Kramer's rule. It's the same thing. Okay, and I was going way back. Then W2 is you keep the first column the same, but then the second column becomes the zero and then the F of X. Okay, once you figure out what those determinants are, you're going to be looking for some functions. And those functions can be found by taking w1 over w and integrating it. And the other one can be found by taking w2 over w and integrating that, okay? Once you have these functions that came out through all this manipulation, right? <laughs> Your particular solution can be found by taking that function that you found times your y1 plus this function that you found times your y2. Now there is like pages of the theorem that proves that this is what it is, okay? I'm not going to go over those pages of proof 
You're just going to have to believe me <laughs> that this is true and that it works, okay? But it is a theorem. It is a box inside your book, okay? So in order for me to give them my final answer, my actual general solution, it's going to be the YC, the guys that I came up with from the beginning, plus the YP, the two terms that I came with up with at the end, okay? Now, the reason why they mention, it says, discuss the constants of integration. When I integrate these pieces here and here, I am not going to be putting plus Cs, okay? I'm just not. And the reason why is because I don't need to. And I'll show you why. If I were to integrate this, okay? So YC is actually this junk up here, right? C1 times something plus C2 times something else, right? That's the YC up there. I'll figure out what those are, but not yet. Then the YP is going to be this part. Now, if I had figured out a constant of integration, I don't want to call it C1 or C2 because I already have a C1 or C2, right? So we'll call it C3 times Y1. And then over here, we'll have C4 times Y2, right? Once I distribute this part here, you're going to get U1 times Y1 plus C3 times Y1. And then C4 times Y2. However, you can combine like terms then. That means that this one and this one are like terms. And if I combine them, won't I just get another constant in front, right? And if I combine this guy and this guy, I'll get another constant in front. I don't need to write those. It's covered when you just had these two terms all by themselves, okay? So those little extra terms over there, these two guys are included already in your YC, okay? So you don't ever have to write your constants of integration when you're doing this method, okay? So I just wanted to cover why we're not going to be doing that, okay? But when I integrate, I'm just going to integrate the functions and I'm not going to be putting my constants of integration, okay? So let's try one because this is a lot of steps, okay? Um, you will be able to have your cases and if you really, really wanted to, you could scribble this down, the U1 and U2, but you'll figure it out. Once you start doing a whole bunch of them, you know. U1 is W1 over W, and U2 is W2 over W. So, let's start from the beginning. Is this in the correct form for me to get my auxiliary equation? Do I have Y double prime plus something times Y prime, or maybe Y prime is missing, plus something times Y, or Y may be missing? Is it in that form? It is, right? So then now we need to write the auxiliary equation. So what is this side going to look like for the auxiliary equation? What will this term turn into? Mm -hmm. And then what will this term turn into? Plus m or plus one? one. Correct. Because it doesn't have a prime, does it? Now, I had already wrote that in there because I got carried away. I was writing the lecture, but I just started solving it. <laughs> so I had to erase it. Now, remember, I'm solving the homogeneous to figure out what YC is. Okay, so notice I just put a zero there. I did not put sine. Okay, sine comes in later in the next part. So I get m squared equals to negative 1, which means m equals plus or minus the square root of negative 1 which means m equals plus or minus i. So that's the third case. Alpha is 0, beta is 1. Which means that yc is going to be c1 e to the 0x cosine of 1x plus c2 e to the 0x sine of 1x. And that's ugly, so I definitely want to clean it up. This is just 1, so C1 cosine x plus C2 sine x. 
So I just cleaned it up so that it's prettier. When I go to try to put it in my little um, matrix, it's nice, right? It's not weird with the zeros and all of that. Well, that means that this is the Y1 all the rest of the steps are talking about. This is the Y2 that all the rest of the steps are talking about, okay? So when I go to set up my first run scheme, the W, it's just going to be Y1 and Y2. And because I'm doing Ron schemes, I have to do the primes of those, right? That's what the next row is, is the primes. So what is the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. And then what is the derivative of sine? Cosine. And if I figure out the Ron scheme, I have to cross multiply and subtract, right? So this becomes cosine squared x minus negative sine squared x, which is the same as cosine squared x plus sine squared x, and that's actually the same as what? Uh-huh. No, not tan squared. Thank you. Is one, yes, you got it. Well, that's nice because then when I have to divide by it, it's not a big deal, right? <laughs> They're not always that pretty, but this one's okay. Okay, now I need to figure out what the W1 and the W2 are. So for the W1, it is the first column that gets replaced, okay? So the second column will stay exactly the way it was. But for W1, it's the first column. That's what the one is for, okay? The first column is going to get replaced with zero in my F. So what is the F in this case? The F of X. Correct. So if it were homogeneous, it would be zero, right? But since it's non-homogeneous, I have to put that function in here. And now I'm gonna do the Ron scheme of this. So cross multiply those, I get zero minus, and when I cross multiply those, I get sine squared. So I just end up with negative sine squared x. Now W2, means the second row is the or second column is the column that's going to get replaced so the first column is needs to be the same as the regular w so notice i went back to the regular w and i wrote cosine and negative sine right the second column is now what's going to become zero and the f okay so the second column is going to be the zero and the sine x so when i multiply by these I get cosine x sine x and when I multiply these I just get zero so I have cosine x sine x I hope I left myself some room because, okay, good, I did. We're not even halfway, right? Maybe about halfway. So now I need to find those weird functions, the u1 and the u2, okay? And u1 is found by doing the integral of w1 over w. And so for w1, we got negative sine squared x, and for w, we just have 1. That's for U1. Now I'm gonna finish this before I set up W2, okay? Because I don't know how much space I'm gonna need to do this integration. Now if you have your book, your book may have the answers, um, and I think it does. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first take out the negative, 
and I don't need the fraction because it's just over one, right? In the very front of your book, which you are allowed to use when you take the test, you've got a whole bunch of formulas in that front of the thing, right? One of them does have for sine squared or it has for sine to any power, okay? And when I use that rule that it has in there, what I'm gonna end up with is one half x minus one fourth sine of two x. But the rule is only for sine squared by itself. So notice I still have to bring my little minus down, right? And that'll get distributed later. So this will become negative one half x and positive one fourth sine of two x. You can do it by hand without having to use that formula, but I'm, it just saves me paper if I use the formulas in the book. But you could convert sine squared into cosine of two x and then integrate it that way, okay? But you would have to have all your trig identities and know how to use them and stuff like that. But you would use the power reducing formulas Okay, W2, and no, I'm sorry, U2. We're going to get by doing W2 over W. And so over here, we have cosine of X, sine of X over 1. And so we don't really need the fraction. We can just write cosine of X, sine of X. And here you use u substitution, but I think this one might, does it have a formula in your book for cosine times sine? You have the book in front of you, Alejandro. Do you see it or no? No? Okay, then they're gonna use u substitution. So what you can do is you can let, it just depends on what you want. You have two options actually. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. You can either let u equal sine of x or you can let u equal cosine of x. It doesn't matter which one. And if your book has one answer, it chose one in particular, I'm pretty sure you can convert it into the other one if you chose a different one. Okay. So if I were to let u equal, I'm going to say sine of x because the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, right? So if I were to let u equal sine of x, then du would be cosine of x dx. So then that integral would become, cosine of x dx would become the du, and the sine of x would become the u. What is the integral of u du? Use your power rule. So it becomes u squared over two, and remember, you don't have to put the plus C's, right? They're not important here. We didn't put any plus C's on U1. We do not have to put a plus C on U2. Then you go back in and you back sub. So what was U? It was sine. So this is sine squared X over two. I'm almost done. I just have to put a bunch of pieces together. Okay, I've done all the math, all the hard part. So if I want to find yp, I have to do u1 times y1 plus u2 times y2, which means I have this function times y1. y1 was cosine plus u2, which is this function, times y2 which is sine. And you can clean this up, but it's not gonna clean up by much. It's still gonna look really ugly. So that's a three, sine cube x over three. And then if I want the general solution, 
that's going to be yc plus yp. So my general solution, or like my final answer, okay, is going to be the c1 cosine of x plus c2 sine of x. That was what we got for yc. And then all of this mess that we got for yp. And I'm trying to squish it in there, but it's not going to fit. So I'm just going to put plus sine cubed x over 2 downstairs. Okay, but all of that whole thing is the final general solution to our original DE. Okay, so you basically have the solution for the homogeneous part and the solution for the non-homogeneous part. Okay. So you can tell already, you're going to have trig, right? There's going to be trig in some of these problems, possibly on the test, trig. So you've got to get pretty handy dandy with your trig integration. Now the answer in the back of the book is this, okay? If you go look in the back of the book, that's the final answer. This mess right here is going to turn out to be zero. Or it'll turn out to be like some number with cosine or some number with the sine in front, okay? I'll do it just to show you but it will simplify and that's why you only see the first three terms in the back of the book okay so if i just write out these two terms and manipulate it first thing i can do is i can turn this back into its sines and cosines so sine of 2x is the same as 2 sine x cosine x. Then this 4 and that 2 will reduce, giving me 1 half, and then I get a cosine squared x, right? So far so good? Then these two things have a 1 half in common, don't they? They also have a sine in common. And if I factor that out, I get cosine squared x plus sine squared x. What is cosine squared x plus sine squared x? It's just 1. So I get 1 half times sine x. So those back two terms just come out to 1 half sine x. But don't you already have a term with sine x? And if I combine C1 or C2 sine x and one half sine x, aren't I still going to get a constant, right? Which is why they don't have these two terms there. They just have these three terms, okay, in your final answer. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. And had I, had I not chosen you to be sine at, up here, let me zoom out. Had I not chosen you to be sine, had I chose you to be cosine, du would have been negative sine, right? Then I would have had a negative u squared over 2, which means I would have had a negative cosine squared over 2. And then after doing all the multiplication and everything, those two terms would have ended up canceling anyway. Okay? And so then you would have had the answer from the very beginning without having to do all this trig manipulation. Okay? 
But just be careful because even though your answer might look different from what's in the back of the book, it may still in fact be equivalent, okay? So when we come in on Tuesday and I say, does anybody have any questions about the homework and you got something that doesn't match the back of the book, that's a good question to ask because maybe it's equivalent and maybe it's not. Maybe something did go wrong. We don't know, okay? But I can check it and we can look at it and we can talk about it, okay? Okay, we have we have enough time to cover one more, but we're not going to be able to cover <laughs> the last two. So we'll do one more, okay? We'll do example two, and we'll save example three and example four for the next class, okay? So we're going to go through that same whole process again. So first pretend that it's homogeneous and solve it using the auxiliary equations, okay? That's how you figure out what the y1 and the y2 are, because those we need that to do everything else. So my auxiliary equation here is going to be m squared and minus 9. And so then I'm going to get m plus 3 and m minus 3. Do you agree or disagree? If I factor that, right? So then I get m equal to what? Negative 3 and positive 3, which means I have case 1 because these are different. These are not the same. One is negative and one is positive, okay? So this is case one, which means that my yc is going to be c1 e to the negative 3x plus c2 e to the positive 3x. It does not matter which one you put in front or which one you put in back, okay? I know that eventually you're gonna use these for your w1s and your w2s, so it may seem like it's gonna matter, but all it means is that here, when you go to multiply these out, this term will be in the front and that term will be in the back. That's all it'll mean at the end, okay? So it doesn't matter which one you put in front or which one you put in back. You'll still get the same answer, or at least one that's equivalent to the same answer, right? <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and identify Y1 is this puppy and Y2 is going to be that guy. So when I go to find the Ron scheme, I'm going to have e to the negative 3x and e to the 3x. For Ron schemes, though, we have to have the derivatives as the second row. So what is the derivative of e to the negative 3x? Mm-hmm. You got it. And then the derivative of e to the 3x. Mm -hmm. And so when I go to calculate that determinant, I get 1 times 3 is 3. And when you have the same base, both have the base e, you add the exponents. What do you get when you do negative 3x plus 3x? What will your exponent become? 0. Minus... Here you have negative 3 times 1, which is negative 3. But when I add the exponents, I get another 0, don't I? So I end up with 3 plus 3, which is just 6, isn't it? Okay. Which is, again, nice. This doesn't always happen, but we just get numbers. <laughs> and it won't when I get to example 3 and 4. <laughs> but for right now, they're pretty, they're nice, and then just getting a number, a constant, okay? So when I do W1, the first column is going to get replaced. The second column is going to stay exactly as it was, okay? But the first column is going to get replaced zero as if it were homogeneous, but it's not homogeneous, so I need to write f of x. What is f of x? Mm -hmm. And so we do our Ron scheme, or determinant. So we get 0 minus 9x e to what exponent? 0, which means this is just negative 9x which is fantastic because that's not hard to integrate, right? So this is a good one. 
an easy one. It's just a matter of setting everything up. W2 means the first column will stay the same, but the second column will get replaced with the zero and the f of x. This one's not so easy. So when I multiply these, I get 9x e to what exponent? Remember, if they have the same base, you add the exponents. So when I multiply these two terms, what exponent will I end up with? Negative 6x. And then minus, well, when I multiply that times 0, I just get 0. So I have this is that entire Ron scheme W2. So then I want to figure out what U1 and U2 are. U1 is going to be the nice one. We're going to integrate W1 over W, which means negative 3 over 2 if I reduce that fraction times the integral of x. What is the integral of x? Power rule says I get x squared over 2, which means we get negative 3x squared over 4. That's what we get for u1. That one was short and simple, not too bad. u2 is going to be the weird one. So we have to take w2, which is this expression, over w. Now I can still factor out and reduce the 9 over 6 to 3 halves, but I have to integrate this. Okay. Now that's going to require integration by parts. Now I could use the formula for integration by parts, or I can just do what's called the tabular method. I don't know, you should have been taught both in Cal 2, but the tabular method is faster. So x and e to the negative 6x, what is the derivative of x? 1. What is the derivative of 1? 0. And since I have 0, I stop. Here, the integral of e to the negative 6x is negative <coughs> 1 6 e to the negative 6x. And if you're unsure, take the derivative of it and make sure you get e to the negative 6x. If I take the derivative of this, I'm basically going to multiply by a negative 6 in front, which will cancel with this one. So I'll end up with that. If you take the integral again, you're going to end up with another negative 1, 6 multiplier, which means I'm going to end up with positive 1 over 36 e to the negative 6x. And you could do the u sub or whatever. I'm just showing you the shortcut okay, on how to integrate those. Then the tabular method says you multiply going in this direction. Since you have zero, that's why you don't need any more rows. The first one will be positive, second one will be negative. If I had more rows, it would be positive, negative, positive, negative, continuing in that pattern. So all in all, I'm going to end up with a negative x over 6, e to the negative 6x. Here I'm going to end up with the negative 1 over 36 e to the negative 6x. That's using the tabular method. Okay, You could do the biparts formula, which is this, and you would get the same thing. But I'll leave that. If you really, really want to do it, you can do it. But that's the integration by parts formula. And you would end up with the same thing. The tabular myth is just faster. So W2 I have now. So now I'm going to go figure out what YP is supposed to look like. YP is supposed to be U1, which was the nice one, times Y1 y1 is e to the negative 3x plus u2 
which is this, times y2, which is e to the 3x. That can and should be cleaned up, definitely. First term is really nothing to do, but the second term, you have the same base. What do you get when you add those exponents? What is negative 6 plus 3x? Negative 3x. Then when I multiply it here, the same thing, negative 6x plus 3x will be negative 3x. So finally, you can write your final answer, which is going to be C1 e to the negative 3x plus C2 e to the 3x. This is I C from the very beginning. I'll push it down. There it is. See right there? YC. That's all I'm writing down here. And then YP is all of this. There's only one problem. This is not going to match what's in the back of the book. I ran out of space. Let me write these smaller so I can squish it in there. That way I can fit everything. The back of the book is not going to have this term. Why would the back of the book not have that term? It is. You've got a constant in front of e to the negative 3x, right? And you have another constant in front of e to the negative 3x. If I combine those two, aren't I just going to still have a constant in front of the e to the negative 3x? So that's why in the back of the book, it won't. And it may, it may or it may not choose to change that to C3 and letting you know that this is different from than what it originally was, okay? But sometimes they just keep it as one. That's just a constant is a constant. <laughs> But this whole thing is your final general solution. Okay. And we only have like four, three minutes left of class. So I'm going to stop the video here. But when we come back on Tuesday, we'll cover example three and example four. So that you have enough to get through the entire homework section. Um, just FYI, the homework is these problems but you probably only have enough to maybe do one through five maybe you can try ten and eleven but you only have enough for sure to do one through five okay one two four and five but that's the entire homework set I think 19 19 through 22 are going to be those um, initial value problems right we hate those because not only do we have to do all the work we've been doing and we have extra, right? <laughs> so it's just putting all the pieces together for those last three. But we'll cover it in the next class, okay?